Hi everyone, my name is Jordan and I'm the community manager here at IndieFlow. Um, and welcome to our Booking Best Practices webinar. This is the second webinar in our end of year Indie Artist Blueprint series. Um, so if we have more coming up, if you missed the first one, it's on our YouTube channel. It features two of our IndieFlow mentors. Um, and today I'm here with one of our amazing mentors, TJ, and we just launched our or revamped our mentor marketplace. So we have a variety of mentor. Um, and just for coming here today, I'll give you guys a free credit for a one-on-one -on -one mentorship session um, for anyone who purchases an annual plan. So definitely get on that. Um, yeah. So hi, TJ. Welcome. Thank you for sitting down with me. Hi. Hey, thanks for having me. Of course. Of course. Um, so I'll let you like introduce yourself to the audience. Like, what do you do? What's a little bit about your background in the music industry? Sure. So, well, I'm based in Ithaca, New York, where I've been for, I think it's been almost 14 years. Um, I grew up on Long Island, was always playing in bands, came to Ithaca, went to music school, studied music education, and was always playing through bands extracurricularly. I guess I'll say throughout all of that. And then I went on and I was a middle and then a high school teacher on Long Island, lived in New York City, gigging a lot. And which eventually I ended up leaving teaching full time to join a few different touring bands. Um, and while I was doing that, I worked on a master's degree in arts presenting and live entertainment management at University of Miami, but that was done remotely, which is pretty awesome. Like there was a tour management class and I had an internship and my tour manager signed off on the, all the hours. So that worked out nice. So then that sparked a music festival that I did up here in Ithaca. I moved back to Ithaca, was touring a lot for like five-ish years, maybe a little bit longer than that, on the road most of the year, working on festivals, helping bands book shows, helping artists manage themselves, um, et cetera, et cetera. Then the pandemic hit, and I'll never forget that day I lost 212 gigs and mm -hmm. then uh, I went on to doing a bunch of arts and crafts and unrelated things, which was honestly awesome in hindsight, um, despite the sadness that the pandemic uh, wreaked havoc on the whole industry and just our lives and et cetera. Um, then once things started to loosen up, started having, doing like house shows and booking my bands at different venues helping other artists get shows and then there was an opportunity to start a new music festival which was a monthly series up here in Ithaca which was three different bands per festival and there's burlesque performances circus performers like 50 plus craft vendors um then shortly after that there is a music venue that was vacant and uh me and my partner at the time we decided to start a music venue. So that got going and then a bunch of other venues eventually contacted me. And so long story short, now there's five different venues that um, I'm booking pretty much full time in addition to one, the one that I own. Um, but I still play a decent amount um, and I uh, help different artists uh, Pretty frequently, even if it's just like a simple phone call, like, oh, what do you think about this? Or helping route a tour, or right now I'm working on it with two different bands on uh, record releases. Um, yeah, I try and fill my life with a bunch of different things and keep every day different. So that's yeah. kind of the abbreviated version of what's going on. Yeah, awesome. You definitely have such an like, interesting story, like, really being on both sides of the industry and like, you know, I, th I think that's super dope. So we'll definitely get into like both sides, working on the business side and working on the creative side as well, since, you know, indie flow fam members are just the CEOs of their career. So they're managing both, which can definitely be difficult and complicated. Um, but because this um, webinar is booking best practices, can you just explain like what exactly is venue booking and what what does that mean to someone who might not have any knowledge about the music industry so basically to make it as simple as possible it's just 
getting a, a date on a calendar at a specific room and putting on a performance and most importantly getting people there mm -hmm. and um, making it as uh, as much of a fair experience for everyone um, on a number of levels. Uh, that's kind of the abbreviated version of it, but each show is a completely different animal. And there's really like, I'm a fan of making each correspondence with different people to be uh, personal mm -hmm. and um, uh, concise and um, efficient. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, ultimately, like we have, we have a friend up here in Ithaca that <clears throat> emphasizes how the word community is a verb and it's something that you do. And that's mm -hmm. kind of, um, that's the center of it all for not just me, but a lot of the people I like to surround myself with. And when that's kind of the mission is to uh, uh, do community, um, uh, a lot of awesome things come with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. So what are kind of the key benefits for artists at various stages of their careers? Um, to booking like their own shows and tours as opposed to like solely relying on like a team behind them or like an agent, like let's say they're just starting out and they don't even have a team. I think like I was saying, doing community and putting yourself out there. Mm -hmm. and, um, when you are putting yourself out there, be as genuine as possible and don't create relationships for the sake of your own career. But mm -hmm genuinely care about other people mm -hmm. um, and because that's one thing people you can you can tell when you're out in the world when people are clearly um about themselves you know mm -hmm. which you have to be to some degree uh especially in this business mm -hmm. if it's like clear to me that you're just trying to develop a relationship just for your own career or for your own ego or whatever it is that's driving um why you do music um then i'm like less likely to want to work with you yeah um, that's not what i'm in it for personally i'm in it to create connections with people and ultimately to promote peace and because that's what music does it's it's you know when i when i was going on tour all the time my girlfriend she she'd be like oh there you go you know you're getting deployed again but it's like true because yeah we, we are we are being deployed but we're luckily not having to go to war yeah you know um so i think that the work that we're doing in the music and just creative industry is really important um on a number of levels especially with the what always seems to be current events in the world mm -hmm. yeah i feel like you hear so much about artists these days like cooking venues that are like way too big for what their actual fan size is because now in like the age of social media like you can have a million followers but that doesn't mean that you have a million true fans mm -hmm. um so can you like describe the process of when you're routing a tour like choosing the right venues and like how do you as a growing artist how do you make the decisions whether like what what capacity venue is right for you in your career at that point well, I, th I think at least when I started and still to this day with certain projects, um, kind of take what you can get. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you have to think about the repercussions of maybe taking an opportunity. Mm -hmm. where there are a lot of people that like, quote unquote, hold the keys to different calendars that might not be making the best decisions. Mm -hmm. I try not to make decisions for them because ultimately it's their business. But if they're like, hey, you know, you've never even put out music before you've never been on the road and you've never played outside your hometown, but here, how about you play my venue for 2000 people on the other side of the country and I'll give you a $20,000 guarantee. It's, it'd be kind of hard to say no to that. Right. But you know, you, you don't want to play to an empty room because also it's about the, the customer and the, the, you know, making a, uh, fans and if they go to your show and it feels awkward the next time they see you on like a calendar somewhere they might not be as like pumped up to go see you if they felt awkward when they were seeing you no matter how good or desirable the music is to their ear yeah yeah that was a really good point about like making your fans like feel awkward i've never thought about it in that like sense like 
yeah, it might be cool to play like a big arena, but like, or big stage, whatever. But if no one's there, like it's just gonna be uncomfortable for everyone. Um, so can we like, let's let's switch gears a little bit and dive a little deeper into like the things that you need to actually like book a show, like in terms of like things that you might have to submit to a venue or an agent. Like you hear the term like EPK talked about and thrown around. And that's like actually something that we have on the Indie Flow platform where you can you know upload all the different things for an epk like bio pictures links and we do have a venue database where you can like submit it directly um to a venue within the platform which is awesome but like what are some things in materials that you've received with people like wanting to play your venue or um whatever in an epk that you think really makes it stand out um and if it was an artist that you didn't know it would kind of like intrigue you to maybe want to work with them like i was saying it's <clears throat> earlier it's about those relationships mm -hmm. where like me and you outside of indie flow i know you went to school in syracuse mm -hmm. like yo what's up um and having just concise usually emails uh -huh. there's an email but what i don't like to see is just like these long like i i have, I have four different general like venue email accounts that i they're kind of like my firewall to my personal uh -huh. like every day like the same kind of like generic three paragraph long here's our band here's what we do here's the epk here's photos yada 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 and then i, I will literally see my phone be like the ding the ding, the ding, the ding, and it's literally copy paste the whole thing. And yeah. sometimes they'll even mess up where they'll put the wrong or they'll forget to uh, change the name of the venue when they yeah. send it. Yeah. Um, but if, if, and a lot of the time, well, not a lot of time, but like, well, actually, maybe a lot of the time, those people can probably find out a way that they have a connection to me. Mm -hmm. If not, like they know that I'm in Ithaca, New York, they could be like, hey, TJ. Um, I went to think of college. I want to bring my band, band back to town. Can you give me holds on these dates? Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to be like, oh, cool. And then I'm going to maybe click on a link to see like, oh, what is this? What is this band anyway? Yeah. They're just like literally listing on all the things. I think it's important to make people want to click on things. Yeah. Instead of explaining everything with all these different things to click on. But just like one or two sentences. That's what I like to see yeah you can for, for some reason there's um there seems to be like some sort of like formula people are going off of mm -hmm. and i do my best to go through them but it's just like overwhelming when you get like a four paragraph email where it's like how about these states but then actually we might be releasing our record on this date so it might make sense for it's like talking to themselves in the email and, right because you know we're we're dealing with high volume when it comes to emails and so many people want to play shows which is so awesome but ultimately we have to make decisions that are best for each individual business mm -hmm. businesses within those businesses. Um, as far as what's appropriate to put on the calendars for each room. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I love like the, the personal element, like even if you don't already have an existing relationship with the person, like do some sort of like, due diligence and see if there's any way that you can connect authentically with them. Um, so you can like build some rapport. So, okay. Once let's say you booked a show, right? Like what are the next steps look like in terms of negotiating terms and all those things and like advancing a show? Like, what does that look like from, I guess, both your side as the venue, but what should artists expect once they get a confirmation that they have a date for a show? Yeah, and I've seen so many different ways that people go about this, whether it's like, you know, really uh, like uh, top notch booking agents to local people, um, which I've honestly seen some local people do it in a better way for me than some of these big booking agencies. But at the same time, um, these agencies clearly have a method that works. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd be curious to see like how often those agencies get to see how other agencies agencies communicate with venues. Mm -hmm. uh, there could be a lot to learn there. Um, and also same thing on, on venue side, like I don't really see how other venues operate. Mm -hmm. to see that just so we can make it as efficient as possible. But as far as like what to expect, I think that 
from in my world, like if if an agent hits me up and like, oh, can we get holds for so and so? And a hold is just like a bunch of different places on the calendar. It's not like a hold in date. Mm -hmm. Target and there's different levels of holds, which we could go into a little bit. But um, I know I've learned instead of saying, hey, yeah, here's these dates that are available. I know that their next email is going to be, can we get an offer? Mm -hmm. uh, so I will be like, yeah, here's those holds. Here's what's available. Here's the offer. And if there's like certain like variables, like a Tuesday night show versus a Saturday night show in this college town, those are going to be two different offers. So I'll, I'll be like, everything's in there. So that, that sort of like a, a, a mode of communication should be thought about from both sides where it's like, like one of my big, biggest pet peeves is when somebody emails me in response to a question, Hey, I'll circle back with you tomorrow. Right. <laughs> I'd rather you just circle back with me tomorrow or even yeah. work when someone says, I'll circle back with you tomorrow. And then I'll get a text message saying, Hey, I just emailed you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think focusing on those things is just makes you more desirable to want to work with mm -hmm. patients. Like, you know, some of these rooms that I'm booking, they are um, not necessarily for the big national touring acts or international touring acts. Mm -hmm. it, we hold space for um, independent uh, musicians that are like learning um, and may not be that well versed in how to communicate with venues and whoever. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's just, I, I try to have patience and like I'm an educator at heart and um, I, that's why I love Indie Flow is because we can do this and, you know, I try to be as, humble as possible because I have a lot to learn. I've learned I'm learning a lot like every day. So I, I'm here for it and I would love to help people um on their journey to get gigs. Yeah, awesome. Um that's why you're a mentor because you you can teach and you have a lot of knowledge. Um you mentioned that there are different levels of holdings when you're like booking an artist or an act or whatever. Can you like explain like the different levels? Cause I like as someone who book shows and like, you know, does graduated in a music business program, I didn't realize there were like different levels to this. So I would love, I would love to learn something right now. <laughs> sure. So, and one of the things with vocabulary in the industry is that different people have their own definitions for it. And I think that we should like reassess the dictionary on for what some of these words mean, but I could tell you like what they mean to me. Okay. Word. Like I have my spreadsheets for each of the venues and say, say like, Hey, the first week of January, Jan one through Jan seven, can I get holds on those dates? Um, and say on January 4th, um, there's three other sh uh, shows ahead of them, but nothing confirmed. Then that would be a fourth hold. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's nothing confirmed, there's like, there's things that people do. I wouldn't say it's shady, but it's like, you know, um, I think it's 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 kind of a, a hedge is that um, like I tend to not give away first holds because I give myself the first hold. So if something magical comes up, I just want to confirm it then and there mm -hmm. instead of going through challenges, which is the next part of it. So say you're hold four on January 4th and you're like, that's the date I want to come to town. Yeah then it's up to me to challenge each of those dates and typically 24 to 48 hours per hold. Okay. Uh, and different venues do it different ways where they'll go like one day at a time down the list or then, or sometimes they'll just hit them all up be like that date's being challenged. Um, I tend to do it that way. Okay. Um, and that way I don't have to email the person that wants that date, hey, I got to challenge all these dates right now. I can just on a day later and be like, it's yours. Or sorry, it's not yours. I literally just did that today. I think it was like a, a third challenge, a third hold or something. That the third hold ended up getting date. Um, and luckily, everyone that I challenged got back to me within like ten minutes. Got you. Okay. Okay. Cool. This this is like making sense. Um. So we have a question in the chat. Can you explain what backline means? Sure. Well, backline. Um. 
we just had to backline a whole show for the legendary headhunters actually last um, week. They had their 50th anniversary on the very day at Deep Dive, uh, our venue here in Ithaca. And basically, they needed all the instruments. They needed keyboards, keyboard stands, drum thrones, drum set, specific stuff too, specific crash cymbals, specific amps, specific microphones, specific all these different things. So if they needed, if somebody needs to show backlined, then that's up to the venue to say yes or no to doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would be, so basically they, they got their offer, they confirmed it, contracted the show, and then there's like some variable expenses to be approved. And so that show is a bit complicated because it was like very specific stuff. And I think it was six different people pulled it together. And um, backline can be pretty expensive. And so instead of racking up the bill, I had somebody do most of it. And I think that was $875. But then the other five people, um, I gave them like tickets to the show or like, you know, different different favors in the future. Uh -huh. So that, that backline bill becomes an expense before hitting points or the back end um, of the deal. Got you. Okay, that makes sense. Well, um, that's, that's how I do it. Yeah, awesome, awesome. We have another question. Can you explain door deals versus guarantees? Sure. So a door deal typically is you're making money from the first person that walks through the door mm -hmm. from $1. Um, so you're getting at least a dollar and there's different types of door deals and some are more predatory than others, but also at the same time, you have to understand that the venue might be taking a huge risk by having you take that stage. So for example, there's, um, there are some bands that come through that have never played this market before. And it's a, it's a risk, you know, because they have their built-in crowd or they don't have the built-in crowd. Um, so there'll be like retroactive percentages on those. Deals. Um, I would never take a show personally that's less than 60%. That's like the lowest I've to deal with. But they go all the way up to, you know, sometimes you'll get 100% of the door. Anyway, that's a door deal. Um, and there's many different types of door deals within door deals. Yeah. A guarantee is um, there's a couple of different guarantee sorts of situations. Um, for example, if you play my club, I might give you a thousand dollar guarantee versus or plus a percentage after expenses. So, and in those expenses, sometimes there's no expenses. Sometimes there's a lot of expenses when you have like big couple thousand person venues the expenses could be twenty thousand dollars play master square garden expenses are probably you know two hundred thousand dollars who knows you know? right uh, but at the no matter what you're getting a thousand dollars but um depending on the plus if it's plus or reverse a percent and how big those expenses are there's a chance that you're going to make more than the guarantee but you know for budgetary purposes that that show you will be getting at least that amount of money Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Okay. Um. Kind of in like the same like vein of like well, I actually mm, it's not really that much in the same vein. But um, how can artists like handle or like unexpected challenges such as like I don't know if they're going on tour and there's a cancellation in one of the venues that they booked or like technical difficulty or like like those kind of things that you can't plan for but are going to occur at some point during the tour. Yeah, like they call in contracts an act of God. Right, right. Something, and can you also explain like what an act of God means, like to anyone who might not know? Well, every contract is its own thing, and I guess that's kind of the point. Is like if you are taking the risk by going on the road, you should uh, pay for a lawyer. Which I'm not a lawyer, and I can't give you legal advice, but um, I suggest getting a lawyer to write a contract for you and make sure that those venues sign it. Um, because if something happens and your contract says, like if it, you know, if your contract says, hey, you know, we're going up to Canada and we know you have, we, 
they know that there's snow up there. And for some reason, if the show gets can if the venue cancels the show because of snow, we should get X percent or the whole thing or whatever the contract says. But it's really important. I'd be a, it's and it's also amazing how many people hit up for dates in the venues. And sometimes I like, especially friends, kind of like call them on it in this subtle way where I see how long it takes for them to go without talking about money. And that I mean, it's gone as far as like until the show's over, be like, so how much do we get paid? Oh Lord. Okay. So that just you know, there's friends and there's business. Yeah. We we should be working together, but um, that needs to be sorted immediately and contract, especially with your friends. Yeah, really, it's really important. Um, yeah, just make sure you have a good lawyer that has a good contract. I know lawyers are expensive, but it might be worth it if you're out on the road and the gas and the van's low and the gig gets canceled and there's no money in the account. Yeah. At least you know, your contract protected you and you can get your money. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, we have a question in the chat about your thoughts on venue merch cuts. That's been like a big point of discussion in the industry lately, but I'd love to know your take on it. Sure. So it was last January, um, the venue that I own, which is the only one that can make this decision, we don't take a merch cut. Uh, 100%, but artists have to sell. If they would like to have somebody local sell merch for them, we have a list of people that do that and whatever you work out with that person to sell your merch is completely your business and not ours. Um, but that being said, I do see both sides of it. Um, and especially with what's happening right now with what Live Nation just tried to pull, um, where they're not only doing 100%, but they're also giving a $1,500 cash buyout in the form of gift cards to gas stations and stuff like that. That is like some mafia stuff that they are trying to take away the power from independent venues such as mine, um, where we can't afford to do a $1,500 cash buyout for every show. You right. know, we did 369 events in, the, in, in 12 months and times that by $1,500. It's, it's, there's literally no way. Yeah. So, um, but they're a huge like publicly traded entity where they can do that. Right, right. Um, so yeah, but yeah, I, I, I see both sides of it though because that is a revenue source and it, it is real estate. Like if you're taking up room in a, in a space, um, it just needs to be fair no matter what. But yeah. I kind of saw the writing on the wall earlier on and it's just, no, we'll make up for it in other ways. Yeah, yeah. In the same vein of like news in the industry, like what are your thoughts on like, ticket scalping and like ticket master and all of like yeah i just love to get your take on that as someone who's a venue owner but also has like you know has on, been on the creative side on the touring side so how do you see it like impact both sides of the industry that you work on you know i haven't had to really deal with it too much but i did just start working with the biggest venue i've ever worked with we haven't put on shows yet because it's a seasonal venue mm -hmm. The shows will start up in late spring. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think scalping is a, a load of BS. Like it's, but I don't think you can really stop it. Right. Um, and honestly, if my band, if there were people scalping tickets to one of my band's show, I'd be like, it's kind of a victory because that's pretty cool. But like you made it. <laughs> at the same time, why is some rando in a parking lot or online making money off of my concert? Yeah. <laughs> no. um, but I think that goes like the heart of that is uh, like legislation needs to be made, which I know that they're kind of working on that. Um, yeah, I just hope I just kind of put faith in people to uh, that they're going to be fair, but that's not what it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, we have another question in the chat. This one is, should artists with released works versus artists with little to no records out yet approach booking differently? And what is the right strategy for this? I don't think, like, whether or not you have music out, I think you should be playing. And you should be getting out there as much as possible because, um, most of 
the capital that I've gotten through music is through performing on stage. Um, just because of like how streaming works now. Like I have a couple of songs that I'm a co-writer on that we did like 20 plus million streams in, in Australia. And I got my check not too long ago, it was $27. I was just like, oh my God, ridiculous. But you know, I, I have to say though, uh, some of my favorite bands that I like to go like uh, see and dance to, they don't have any music out. Some of them don't even have social media. And some of them are just people that are just hobbyists that are just amazing. Where it's like, oh no, I'm not, this isn't my focus. But in any case, I, I really think that putting yourself out there is um, is is good on multiple levels. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I love that. Um, so you also have a festival. Can you talk about if there is like a different booking process from booking like a venue versus a festival? And honestly, like what that looks like from both sides as an artist and as a venue slash festival owner? Similar but different. Okay. Dealing with the same people. Festivals, more times than not, it's just a flat fee. Okay. Um, and if it, yeah, it's, and there's different formulas I have based on how much risk I'm willing to take and also like where the festival is at in its lifetime. Mm -hmm. As far as first year, second year, third year fest or whatever it is. Also, yeah. what's being programmed on it, what else is happening at the festival, what other streams of, you know, because my, my whole MO is to get artists paid as much as possible, but at the same time, not burdening the different venues that have the shows. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's similar and different, but the, the two, like, usually it's just flat fee where we're uh, very rarely will there be a flat fee for a show at a club, unless it's like a free show where you can't, you know, so unless you're willing to give away a cut of the bar, then it might be based on how many people are there, but it's based on their ticket size mm -hmm. so they spend at the bar. Uh, but then that can get a little messy uh, because then there's also we did a show that was like a biggie smalls tribute show it was a full band amazing awesome. that show is 93 people paid the next night there was a punk rock night with like four bands and there was like 300 people paid um that Biggie Smalls night did 2.3 times the amount of bar sales wow. than Punk Rock night. So that's like, as an owner of a bar as well, it's in the venue. Um, things that I think about when programming um, different shows and on what days of the week and stuff like that and like what the guarantees are and, you know, I'm not trying to be biased on genres or anything, but it's important to have when it comes to the schedule and what's happening when yeah yeah no that makes sense the different like audiences and age groups and all of those things like that pulls different crowds for different purposes that totally makes sense um and we only have about 10 minutes left but people still feel free to throw in questions all these have been great um kind of diving a little bit more into the festival stuff for festivals is it common for the festival to pay for like travel expenses and lodging like how does that work it depends on like what your level is and like you know it's um uh the word that we love the most exposure which is um, you know whatever uh <laughs> it depends you have to be realistic with where you're at like mm -hmm. when i was playing with like uh like bigger artists doing fly dates and playing big festivals for tens of thousands of people then yeah, you're gonna see buyouts for flights and accommodations and different levels of hospitality that you you know. Um, you're in, I play trombone, so I've never had a trombone backlined, but you will see like everything will be backlined. But then if it's like if you're kind of just getting started and you're being put in front of the biggest crowd of your life, playing at the earlier part of the, the schedule of the festival, then you're probably not gonna see it. Mm -hmm. but at the same time never play for free <laughs> um good points made there <laughs> never sell tickets like paper tickets one of my first me memories being in this business was in 10th grade where we didn't sell enough tickets to the show 
and I was in the basement in 10th grade and our guitar player was talking to the promoter and the promoter whipped out a box cutter and held it to his throat. Like, give me the money. Oh even though we, yeah. So it's kind of a, can be sketchy. Um, but yeah, just never play for free and never um, sell tickets on a promoter's behalf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great point put there. Um, and we talked about like the back line earlier, but um, what are, oh, this is, yeah, I was literally about to mention a rider. Can you explain um, to people who may not know what's a rider and at your venue, like what's the craziest thing that you've seen on a rider? Well, there's different types of riders. There's like hospitality rider, like I'm seeing the Eminem comment. Yeah. <laughs> rider where, <clears throat> like we have Moon Hooch playing this this weekend, and they're like, "Oh, the uh, the thirty two channels of the board needs to be in working order." And um, one of our channels have been ghosting on us, and so I was like, "I'm not even messing with that. I'm going to rent a board." Mm -hmm. Typically, that would go as an expense. I told the artists, "Like, we'll pay for that. Don't worry about it." But that was part of their tech writers making, you know. And also like stage towels. Well, that's kind of hospitality, but they'll they'll put it in different spots. But craziest thing is there's this band called Bella's Bar Talk out of Northampton, Massachusetts, that every time they play in Ithaca, they usually want a 1990s VHS of a Jim Carrey movie and two unopened packs of Pokemon cards. <laughs> so that's like the two weirdest things. And it was just like yeah. No, that is that is kind of random. Um, I guess so. Let's just before we end, um, switch gears into the creative side. We've been diving so deep on the business side, which is dope. But as someone who's also on the creative side, um, what are some of the traits that you've seen in the best bands that you've toured with? Traits, yeah, healthy living, honestly. That's one of the most draining things is playing in bands um, that whenever you're touring, no matter what day of the week it is, whatever city you're in, the people want to have a special experience with you. Mm -hmm. And typically in those situations where people are meeting artists that they don't typically see and that they kind of idolize, yeah. they're anxious. And with that, um, they use the aid of like substances to uh, kind of get on some sort of level with people. Yeah. So just making sure that you're not, or that you are being proactive with your health when it comes to, you know, substances specifically, because, you know, almost in every VH1 behind the music, there's some sort of tragic substance abuse situation that either drives people apart or people die. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, if you want us, if you want to have a long, like if you want to have longevity in your career, it's really important to take care of yourself. But also at the same time, though, when you're around people that are maybe being toxic to themselves or to others, holding space for them in a way that doesn't come off as condescending, because there's been some people like, you know, like saviorism, where it's like people coming in on a, num a number of different levels saying like, guys, we drank last night or whatever, where it's like, yeah, it's really important to like check in with the people you care about, but there's a way to do it. And what's awesome is there are different programs and um, things for people to call or be a part of. Like, I forget what it was called, but in Australia, every single green room I was in, there's like this free um, hotline that you can call for people in the industry, whether you're a uh, stagehand or you know, roadies or musicians or wherever, whoever, you can call this number and talk about your situation. And they'll kind of help you navigate it. Wow. Um, it's, yeah, it's really dope. That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That, that was, that was a great piece of advice. That's yeah, that was amazing. Um, and another question, can you speak to the importance? Cause I, they're just, I've had so many experience with this, but the importance of like, rehearsing and like sound checking like before your show and like any tips to like maximize the time that you have allotted for sound check sound check should be just that nothing more especially if there's a room that's open where there are customers in there mm -hmm. 
nothing drives me more uh, cr crazier than hearing some like guitarists up there just like shredding sweeps for maybe out of anxiety, maybe because they're actually warming up, maybe they're trying to show off, maybe whatever. Yeah. Just when you're there, just don't noodle unless like I'm a brass player, I have to. Right. You know, you can't just pick up the trombone and just play it. You should warm up a little bit, but it's find a space to do that. And just don't waste anyone's time. The amount of noodling that I've had to deal with in my life is just so annoying. Yeah. Uh, so just, especially if you're like a higher gun, which is what I have most, what I'm most used to, um, just only play when you're asked to play. And when you do play, play something that's not like clear that don't like, you know, don't go crazy. Play something humble. <laughs> yeah. And, on the microphone or whatever you're doing but don't yeah. don't go ham you're only trying to prove yourself to yourself at that point and it's right that right. yeah save it for the show like you're about to perform later bring the talent there um that's a really good piece of advice what's the greatest lesson you learned or like or it can be like highlight of your career like working on both the creative side and the business side of the music industry i'm sorry what's my what like, what's the greatest lesson that you've learned? Mm. I don't know. I think um, it's really important to listen. Um, and just kind of hold space for people, um, at least to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a very interesting industry we're in. Um, especially like there's like three, they say three people do three things. They, you know, there's home work and play mm -hmm. reason in the play part of everyone's lives. It kind of can become chaotic and uh, dramatic and um, a lot of egos flying all over the place because, you know, you don't brag to people how you clean your dishes. You know, like, yo, I got that down. <laughs> you know, um, so yeah, I think just listening more than speaking, even though we're the one speaking right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I try to be as chill as possible, but also not let people take advantage. Yeah, for sure. That's a great thing. Um, before I ask my last question, I just want to remind everyone in the chat um, that I threw a link earlier for a free one-on-one -on -one session with our mentors. You could do one with TJ and ask even more of your questions, which is amazing. Um, I'll throw it in the chat again, but yeah, it's for anyone who purchases an annual plan. So definitely get on that, get that free one-on-one -on -one session because um, all the mentors are incredible. But for our final question, um, what can people expect from you like in a mentorship session? Honestly, whatever you would want to work on, um, yeah, if you want help routing a tour or you want help like how to cold call, call or um, really anything, I'm down to talk about anything and work on anything and, and set, uh, you know, assignments, however you work. There's different types of learners and uh, I want to know how you learn the best, at least as far as you know how. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no like blanket thing, truly whatever. Nice. Period. So sign up, get that free session. Um, and TJ, thank you so, so, so much. This has been awesome. Thank you so much.